Okay, so the Wife of Bath prologue line 718 onwards. Key things to look out for in this last bit of the prologue, the cyclical nature of it. The key theme of mastery and sovereignty. The irony that she and Jankin are at peace, but only after he has burned his book, and also given her governance of house and land, but also his tongue. She may gain mastery, but anti-women ideas still continue in the friar's interjection. OK, so since we last looked at the previous PowerPoint, um, we knew that Jankin was going through his book of wicked wives. And it's, she said, on line 713 onwards. I'll just go through that last bit to remind us to do the transition between the two PowerPoints. Upon a night, Jankin, that was our sire, read on his book as he sat by the fire, of Eva first, that for her wickedness was all mankind brought to wretchedness, for which that Jesus Christ himself was slain, that brought us back with his heart blood again. OK, so that's what we've got to. I'll remind you that quickly. Um, upon a night, Jankin, the master of our house, read this book as he sat by the fire of Eve first for her wickedness, as mankind was brought to wretched, wretched, uh, wretchedness. Um, so Eve, excuse me, for her wickedness, all mankind brought to wretchedness. So um, this book, this collection of writings of the anti-women agenda at the time. So Eve, because she was wicked, taking the apple from the Garden of Eden, all mankind was brought to wretchedness because of Eve's wrongdoing. And Jesus was killed because of her and brought us back with his heart's blood to so the sacrifice on the cross. And so this book suggests that because of Eve, this female, mankind was brought to wretchedness. Even Jesus was killed for this. And then we carry on with this. Lo, here express of woman may ye find, that woman was the loss of all mankind. Though read he, me, how Samson lost his hairs, sleeping, his lemon kit it with her shears, through which treason lost he both his yen. The ready he me, if that I shall not lie, of Hercules and of his Dianae, that caused him to set himself afire. OK, so let's go through that. Um, so he's, he, he has um, examples of women you can find who cause the loss of all mankind. So here, clearly, that's, that's this here, here express, you may find here clearly you can see um, that women were the cause of loss of all mankind. Then he read to me how Samson lost his hair sleeping. His lover cut it off with her shears. Of course, Samson and Delilah. Um, and that's in your notes at the back of the book as well. So Samson um, had st incredible strength and he admitted uh, that this was a gift from God to Delilah and she cut his hair in his sleep. Though uh, through which treason he lost both his eyes. Then he read to me, if I shall not lie, of Hercules and Dianera. Now, this, as you can see in the notes on the right, um, that caused himself to set himself afire. Now, um, this is taken, this is uh, out of context. Dianera gave Hercules the shirt of Nessus as a means of renewing their love. She did not know the shirt was poisoned. So this is actually a text that has been misused for misogynist use. And so this is, um, this is an example. It's in Jenkins' book, but it's wrong. And um, that's, again, another example of, of the way that he misuses, or these, this book misuses the... No thing forgot he the care and the woe that Socrates had with his wife as tall. Al Zatiba cast piss upon his heed, the silly man sat still as if he were deed. He wiped his heed, no more does he say, but ere that thunder stint cometh the rain. Of Pasiphar, that was queen of Crete for shrewdness, him thought the tale is sweet. Fie, speak no more, it is a grisly thing. Of here horrible lust and here like king. OK, so we'll just go back over that little bit. And then I'll go between the two pages as usual. There'll be a, there'll be a break, as there usually is, um, between the two slides. Um, so I'll go 
forward and then you can go forward when you're ready. So no thing, he didn't forget a thing of the care and the woe. Really important that you remember that. Remember the woe in marriage right at the beginning. Um, and also, of course, really important right at the end of her, of her story, um, line 811, but as the last with much care and woe. So line 811. Really look out for that. It's the sense of the cycle, the completion of her tale of woe that is in marriage. Really, really important. You think of that, the care and the woe. Let's go on to the Socrates passage. So um, Socrates had with his two wives. Now what's really important is um, Socrates was a scholar and he was said to have had, had marital difficulties. But actually uh, he then tells an apocryphal, so a false little story about married life, um, which actually comes from St. Jerome. And of course Jankin is quoting St. Jerome. So... Um, but, it's, but what's interesting, of course, is this is not true. So this is an apocryphal little story. So how Xantipa cast piss upon his head. This poor man sat as still as if he were dead. He wiped his head and no more dared he say anything except before thunder stops, there comes rain. Um, and it's again this the idea of it's Im impossible to escape um, marriage but of course this comes from um, as I said comes from St. Jerome again now on to the next bit we've now got Pasifa Queen of Crete now she had sex with a bull and gave birth to a minotaur part bull part man and he uh, Jankin finds this tale amusing, sweet, is what she uses at the top of the next page. And she says it's a grisly thing uh, because of her horrible lust and her liking. But it's used as an example of how hideous women's desires are. And um, so this, she, this pa uh, pacifier is being used as another example of how women's lusts and women's disgusting behaviours um, are making them wicked. And what we've got is, we've now got a, not just reading his book, but of course he's reading it aloud, which I'm sure I mentioned before. We have the story of Eve, Eve excuse me, in the Garden of Eden. And this is just a long list of wives who've betrayed, who've humiliated, who have murdered their husbands. Some wives um, we're about to look at in a moment managed all three. So they killed them and then had sex with their lover in the bed while the dead husband lay with his face upright, so his face upwards on the floor. Um, and Jenkins about to go on to talk about how um, another woman drives a nail into her husband's brain. And this for a modern reader, so context, for a modern reader is really, or a modern audience is really shocking and horrifying. But actually what's interesting is Chaucer's using only a fraction of the anti-woman tales that he could have used. He's got a huge, um, there's a huge plethora of writing at the time that was anti-woman. And of course what's interesting is we get, to, we've got to look out for the fact that she's going through this long list and it does feel oppressive. It does feel oppressive. And we feel how she is oppressed by this. Um, let's carry on. So a pacifer that was the queen of Crete. And we'll carry on over the page. So for Pasifa, um, that was the queen of Crete. For sheer malignancy or wickedness, for sheer wickedness, he thought the tale sweet or amusing. Fie, speak no more. It is a grisly thing of her horrible lust and her pleasure, and she doesn't want to talk about it. So, fie, speak no more. It's a grisly thing. And so she is horrified by this thing that he read to her, amusing himself with this story of this woman who has sex with a bull and then gives birth to a minotaur. Um, and she, she doesn't want to refer to it. Of Clytemestra, for here lettery that falsely made her husband for to die, he read it with full devotion. Now, this is about Clytemestra. Clytemestra um, was the wife of Agamemnon, the wife of Agamemnon. And while Agamemnon was away at Battle of Troy, as it says in the green on the left, um, she took a lover. 
while her husband was away at the Battle of Troy. And then when he returned, she lulled him, uh, she killed him, excuse me, not lulled him, that's my mistake, she killed him with an axe when he was in his bath, when he returned. And so again, she took a lover for her lechery, for her uh, lech lecherousness, falsely or treacherously made her husband die. And Jankin reads it devotedly. Jankin, he read it with full good devotion. He read it devotedly. And devotion is a kind of um, lexis you might use about religious belief. Um, devoted to someone or devotion. And of course, this is his text. He takes it as, as his, this is his belief system, this book of Wicked Wives. He told me eek for what occasion. Amphiorax at Thebes lost his life. Mine husband had a legend of his wife, Eriphilem, that for an auch of gold hath privily unto the Greek has told where that her husband hid him in a place for which he had at Thebes sorry grace. Of Livia told he me, and of Lucia, they both made her husband as for to die, that one for love, that other was for hate. Livia, her husband, one late and even late, empoisoned hath, for that she was his foe, Lucia, Lycris, loved her husband so that, for he should alway upon her think, she gave him switch a manner love drink, that he was dead ere it were by the morrow, and thus Algate husband has han sorrow. Then told he me how Un Latimus complained unto his fellow Arius that in his garden growed such a tree on which he said thou that how that his wife is three hanged himself for her heart despite us. O oh, leave a brother, quoth this Arius, give me a plant of Dilka blissed tree, and in my garden planted shall it be. Okay, so let's cover that. So, line 740 onwards. He told me also with what occasion Amphiorax at Thebes lost his life. And see notes. Um, so, Amphiorax is the husband. Eriphalim is the wife. So, you've got them there. Amphiorax is the husband. Eriphalim is the wife. And she was bribed. And this says a brooch of gold. Um, some notes have said a necklace. So, she was bribed with... Um, an object, she's bribed with an object, to tell the Greeks where her husband's hidden. And there at Thebes, he's killed. He has a sorry fate. So um, I'll read it in a translation. My husband had a legend of his wife, Ephilim, that for a brooch of gold hath secretly unto the Greeks told where her husband hid him in a place, for which he had at Thebes a sad fate. So he was, the wife was bribed to tell the opposition where her husband was hiding, and then they killed him. Then we go on to Olivia and Lucia. Luci. So these are two. Livia poisoned her husband for, uh, at the instigation of her lover, so she, ha she was having an affair. She hated her husband, and so she poisoned him. And Lucia, Luci or Lucia, I don't know, accidentally poisoned her husband. She loved him so much, she didn't want him to look at anyone else. So she gives him a love potion, but she gives him too much and he dies. So let's go through that. Of Livia told he me, and of Luci, they both made their husbands for to die. So they made one for love, Luci, and the other for hate, Livia. Livia, her husband, one evening late at night, empoisoned him because he was her enemy. Lucia was lecherous. She loved her husband so much that in order that he should always look upon her face, or always think upon her, actually, always think upon her, she gave him such a sort of love drink, so uh, such a, a type of love potion, that he was dead before the morning. Thus, always, husbands have sorrow. And this is really, that's the kind of key line. It's these using examples to say, look how difficult men have it. This is why husbands always have sorrow. 
Then, and we again have the next one. So we had line 740. He told me also, and then he told me. So we've got the sense of 740, then told he me. So we've got this kind of listing again and again and again, these laying on of examples. Then he told me how on how Latimus complained unto his fellow Arius. Now, this is a hanging tree story. Uh, this is, was in wide circulation at the time, hanging tree. It's seen in, um, it's in your notes. It's used in Erasmus and Cicero. You can look in your cross-reference at the back. And the idea of a hanging tree. Now, Latimus complained unto his, follow, his fellow uh, friend of his, Arius, that his garden grew, grew such a tree and that all his wives hang themselves on it out of bitterness of heart, heart despite us. And so they hang themselves on it. Oh, dear brother, this Arius said, give me a shoot of that same blessed tree and in my garden shall it be planted. The idea that in his garden complain, uh, is this tree, this guy's complaining about this tree in his garden, his wives have killed themselves, and Arius wants this tree, i.e. he wants to kill his wife. And um, we'll in a moment go over the page, but I'll read you across the page. Of latter date of wives hath he read, that some hath been slain her husband in her bed, and let her wretched die to her all the night, when the corpse lay on the floor upright. Okay, so I'll go over. I'm now going to hear about, um, later on, he read about wives who killed their husbands, and then let their lecture copulate with them while the corpse is on the floor. I'll go over the page. So we've got now onto the top of the next page. So of latter date of wives hath he read that some have killed their husbands in their bed and let their lecture copulate, that's dite, copulate with her all night when the corpse lay on the floor on its back. Upright means face upright, so face upwards. And some had driven nails in his brain, while that they slept, and thus they had him slain. Some had him if poison in her drink. So we've got this kind of the um, iambic pentameter is really clear here, and it's got this kind of light-hearted kind of tone almost. Some had slain her husband in her bed, and let her let her die her all the night when that the corpse lay in the floor upright. And we've got the sense of this easy rhythm to describe these ho horrible stories, horrible stories of women. A woman who kills her husband, has sex with her lover all night in the bed while her corpse lies on the floor on its back. Other women drive nails into their husband's brain while they're asleep and that's how they kill them. And some have poisoned them in their drink. And then, really important, line 772, he spake more harm than heart may bethink, and therewithal he knew of more proverbs than in this world there grow in grass or herbs. Bet is, quoth he, that habitation be with a lion or a foul dragon than with a woman using for to chide. Bet is, quoth he, high in the roof abide than with an angry wife down in the house. They been so wicked and contrarious, they hate that their husband love an a, he said. A woman cast her shame away when she casts off her smock. And furthermore, a fair woman, be sh but that she be chaste also, is like a gold ring in a sour's nose. Let's go through that. He spake, he spoke more harm than a heart can imagine, and concerning this he knew of more proverbs than in this world there grows grass or herbs. Better it is, said he, to have your, the, your, the place you live, your habitation, with a lion or a foul dragon, than with a woman who is constantly nagging. Better it is, said he, to live high in the roof, in the attic than with an angry wife down in your house. They are so wicked and contrary. They hate whatever their husbands love. They always hate whatever gives their husbands pleasure. He said, a woman casts her shame away when she casts off her undergarments. So if a woman's naked, she has no shame. 
so the or kind of throwing away your modesty and furthermore a beautiful woman unless she is also chaste is like a gold ring in the nose of a pig so a beautiful woman unless she's also pure unless she's not having sex unless she's also um, virginal is like a gold ring in the nose of a pig she may be beautiful but she is still a pig and we get to this she no longer accepts this these two lines now really important who would wend or who would suppose the woe that in mine heart a was and pain and when i saw he would never find to read and on this cursed book all night Oh, suddenly three leaves have I plight out of his book, right as he read, and eke I with my fist so took him on the cheek, that in our fire he fell backward and down. Suddenly the pace, her response, he's, we've had, you know, nearly a hundred lines of him going through all these wicked wise, and she questions, who would imagine, who would a when? Who would imagine? Who would a wend? Or who would suppose the alliteration there? Really interesting, a eh? really memorable. Who would a wen? Or who would suppose the woe in my heart was in pain? This real rhetoric. She no longer wants misogynist stereotypes. She it, it, this we feel and the pain, the woe, and really important that t the tone of that. Who would a when, or who would suppose the woe that in my heart was in pain? Who can imagine, who can suppose the woe that in my heart was and the pain? And when I saw that he would never finish to read on this cursed book all night, they were in bed, remember? And suddenly, all suddenly, three leaves I plucked, plight, out of his book, right as he was reading, and also I with my fist took him on the cheek, that in our fire he fell backwards down. Now, earlier on, she admitted to tearing one page out of his book, but now at the climax of her prologue, she admits she tore out three, and we've got the absolute centre point of her prologue right here. Really important you remember this. All the way through, we've had this idea of woe in marriage, mastery, her conflict with the church, conflict with teaching, conflict with her spouses. We've got the centre point of marriage, conflict, men and women, gender, key. This is key, key, key. And she reacts. She responds. And what's interesting is this is symbolic. She is defying male authority. She is absolutely defying male authority. She's pushed beyond endurance. The numerous examples of women's failings, she's heard them again and again. And the idea she, she accepts she will not stop. And this open defiance of male authority. And also, it's a very powerful act of vandalism. Manuscripts at this point in history were enormously rare and expensive. This is context. Manuscripts were enormously rare and expensive. So she's tearing out pieces of his book. And this is a turning point, an absolute climactic turning point. She not only tears his book, tears out these, literally tears out these stories about women, but also this is, she retaliates physically by hitting him. He retaliates by hitting her. And there's this balance, this struggle for her power, absolute struggle for power. But what's interesting, and we're about to see this, is he's furious, but he's instantly mortified when he realises she seems killed. We'll come to that in a moment. But this is key. These lines are so important. Hear them, read them aloud, get to know them. And this is the battle for mastery, for, for sovereignty. Um, and he leaps up and strikes him. Excuse me, he leaps up and strikes her. She lies on the floor as if dead. Now, please note, very important, she lies as if she's dead, but she's able to look at what he's doing. So it seems she may well be fainting this, so faking this. And of course, that's so brilliant, isn't it? Alison, to get sovereignty, to get mastery, she is manipulative. This is a masterstroke. He hits her, and he is absolutely horrified that she seems dead. But he's, she's watching him, 
and then was about to run. Well, it's just about to run away. Oh, she comes out of the swoon. What? Well, just by chance. So absolute masterstroke of manipulation. And so we'll carry on. And what I'll do is I'll pause at the page break, um, but I'll just go through this quickly in modern English. He upstart as like a mad lion, and with his fist he hits me on the head. And in the floor I lay as if I uh, on the floor I lay as if I were dead. And this course how she goes deaf. And then over the page it's going to go. Um, he was about to run away till at last out of my swoon I breathed. Okay. So I'll go through this bit in Chaucerian and then over the page. And up he start as doth a wood leon, and with his fist he smote me on the heed, that in the floor I lay as I were deed. And when he saw how still that I lay, he was aghast, and would and fled his way, till at a last out of my swore I breed, Oh, hast thou slain me, false thief, I said, and for my land, thus hast thou murdered me, ere I be deed, yet will I kiss a thee. And near he came, and kneeled fairer down, and said, Dear sister Alisaunas, help me, God, I shall thee never smite that I have done. It is thyself to white. Forgive it me, and that I thee beseek. And yet, eftsoons I hit him on the cheek, and said, Thief, thus much am I reek. Now will I die, I may no longer speak. Okay, so I love this bit. Just a note I meant to say. Brilliant imagery. The incredible um, kind of vivacity of the way she speaks with the way she plucked. Also with my fist, took him on the cheek, fell backwards down. And then up he start like a wood lion, like a mad lion. And with his fist he smiled. Got this, so many verbs, such activity suddenly. She's been listening and listening and listening and listening and listening. And then suddenly this is action. He hit me on the head. And then when he saw how still I lay, he was aghast and would have run away. Till at a last, at last, just in time, out of my swoon, I breathed. Now, it's so important, this tactical masterstroke. She sees his behavior. She clearly is not so close to death that she can't watch him. Oh, have you killed me, you false thief, I said. Have you murdered me for my land? But before I die, I will have one more kiss. Now, this is intellectual mastery, as I've said on the left-hand side. Cross-reference line 389 to 92. This is intellectual mastery. She takes the moral advantage. He's hit her. He feels she's dead. He's absolutely taken on the back foot. This is... She pushes her moral advantage. I will have one more kiss before I die. And there he came and kneeled nicely down or... Um, uh, the other possibility is another critic said f submissively. So he kneels down submissively. Irony, of course. And then he addresses her in respectful terms. Fellow member of the church or fellow member of society. Dear Sister Alison, help me God. I will never hit you. The, I have done it. It is yourself to blame. It is yourself to white. It is yourself to blame. Forgive me, though. And that I beseech you. I beg most sincerely. So he does beg. He does blame her. You only have yourself to blame. But I beg you, forgive me. And yet immediately I hit him on the cheek and said, Thief, take this much revenge. I've taken my revenge. Now will I die. I may no longer speak. So she... It continues to press home her advantage. And this is really important. This line is the cycle. But at a last, with much care and woe, we fill accord us by selvin too. Ye have me all the bridle in mine hond, to hand the governance of house and lond, and of his tongue, and of his hond also, and made him bren his book anon right though. And when that I had getten unto me by maestri all the sovereignty, and that he said, Mine own true wife, do as thee lust the term of all thy life. Keep thine honour, keep eke mine estate. After that day we had a never debate. God help and me soul, I was to him as kind, 
as any wife von Denmark unto Eind, and also true, and so was he to me. I pray to God that sit in majesty, so bless his soul for his mercy dear. Now will I say my tale, if you will hear. I love this completion, and I'm trying to read it in the Arabic pentameter because it's got the sense, that lovely rhythm to it, lovely rhythm to it. It's cycle. This was my tale of care and woe, but at last, with much care, what much woe? Remember the care and woe that, woe that is in marriage. He gave me the bridle, all in my hand, to have the governance of house and land, and of his tongue, and of his hand also. I made him burn his book right now, all very swiftly. And when I had got that unto me, by mastery, all the supremacy, and that he said to my own true wife, Do as you wish all the terms of your life. Guard thy honour, keep my reputation. After that we never had an argument. God help me also. I to him was as kind as any wife from Tenmark to India. And also true, he was to me. I pray to God, who sits in majesty, bless his soul for his mercy dear. Now I'll tell my tale if you will hear. We've got the sense of completion. And after all the tactics, they're reconciled. He burns his books. She has all the control. And what's fascinating, of course, and I did put this on the first slide of this one. Isn't it fantastic? As she says, you know, we were absolutely at peace, but I had the mastery. I had the supremacy. I had the sovereignty. He has totally surrendered. And, of course, what's fascinating is she she's completely destroyed his authority. Having achieved dominance, she says they lived happily and she was kind and true to him of course foreshadowing the tale woman achieving dominance happiness the wife's whole prologue has led up to this assertion that it is better when women are in control and it's an absolute masterstroke the where the woe the conflict the wicked wives the biology all her justification for her decision and then she gets power, this master stroke, and she destroys the anti woman literature. She destroys the anti female literature that he used against her. Literally, we see them going up in flames. He burns his book. And of course, the irony is this peace and harmony is because he's given her all the power. So this is triumphant, triumphant. And what's interesting is she has really dealt male domination a very healthy blow. She's taken her revenge. And then we'll go on to the friar. The friar laughed when he had heard all this. Now, dame, quoth he, so have I joy or bliss. This is a long preamble of a tale. And when the summoner heard the friar Gale cry out, Lo, quoth the summoner, God is armed too. A friar wolf intermet him evermore. Lo, good men, a fly and eke a friar will fall in every dish and eke matter. What speakest thou of perambulation? What amble or trot or peace or go sit down? Thou lettest our disport in this manner. Yea, wilt thou so, sir summoner? quoth the friar. Now, by my faith, I shall, ere that I go, tell of a summoner such a tale or two, that all the folk shall laugh and in this place. Now, else, friar, I beshrew thy face, quoth the summoner, and I beshrew a me, but if I tell a tale, two or three, of friars, before I come to sitting born, that I shall make thy heart for to mourn, for well I would thy patience is gone. Our hooster cried, Peace! And that anon, and said, Let the woman tell her tale. Ye fair as folk, the drunken bin of ale. Do, dame, tell a forth thought tale, and that is best. Already, sire, quoth she, right as you lest, if I had license of this worthy friar. Yes, dame, quoth he, tell a forth, and I will hear. So, the interjection of the friar and the summoner. And what's interesting about the summoner is he's 
speaks up, but not because he likes the wife. He speaks up just because he can't abide the friar. So the summoner and the friar can't abide one another. The friar laughs when he realises the wife has only just reached the end of her prologue to tell her tale. It angers the summoner, and he compares the friar to an interfering fly, buzzing at every dish. And you can see uh, on the left of your page, I've drawn a teeny tiny picture of a fly going into a, into a cup. Um, so a friar is unable to mind his own business. The host intervenes to stop them from arguing and asks the wife to continue with her tale. And of course, she speaks in heavy irony if the friar gives me permission, license, heavy irony. So if we thought that the end of the um, we, if we thought the end of, end of the anti-female tradition was over in her burning of the book and the tearing of the pages, we were wrong, because of course the friar immediately laughs at the wife. The friar is a man of the church, is a traditional enemy of the women in middle of ages in middle ages context. So the battle continues, the battle of the genders. The summoner comes to the wife's defence, um, but what's interesting is the summoner, in the entire of the uh, Canterbury Tales, the summoner is uh, a rogue diseased, drunken, corrupt. And if Chaucer had wanted to defend the wife, he would have given her a better champion. So what's interesting is, of course, the wife is more than capable of defending herself, as you see in the tale. But let's go through this quickly. So now, dame, said he, uh, so have I joy or bliss. This is a long preamble of a tale. He's complaining. So, as I have joy or bliss, this is a long preamble of a tale. When the summoner heard the friar cry out, Lo, quoth the summoner, by God's arms, he's kind of swearing, by God's arms too, so by God's arms. A friar will interfere him always. Lo, good men, a fly and also a friar will fall in every dish and every discussion. What are you speaking about, pre preamble? Pre preamble, he's misunderstood, notes that, preamble. Um, and of course, what... The friar meant was an introduction. This is a long preface or a long introduction to your tale. <laughs> this is a long preamble. And what, of course, what's interesting is the summoner doesn't know what a preamble is. But he thinks it must have something to do with an amble, which is an easy pace when you're riding a horse. Okay? So, he's not very bright. What? Amble or trot or keep still or sit down. You're spoiling our fun in this manner. So shut up, don't spoil our fun. But he also hasn't understood what preamble means. And then the friar says, is that how you want it, summoner? Is that how, is that how, is that wilt how you want it? So is that how you want it? Kind of, oh, is that how you want it, said the friar. Now, by my faith, I shall, before I go, tell of summoner such a tale or two. Oh, oh, oh I can tell a tale or two about the summoner that all the folk are going to laugh at you. Oh, well, said the summoner, I curse thy face, said the summoner. You know, now else, for I, I beshrew thy face, I curse your face, said the summoner, and I curse me if I don't tell a tale or three about friars before I came to Sittingbourne that will make your heart mourn, and I know your patience is gone. Idea is that summoners, they're both saying, well, I've got a story, I can tell about a tale or two about you, I can tell a tale or two about you, before, etc. Ridiculous. Absolutely hilarious. Sittingbourne, 40 miles from London, most likely a stopping point on the Canterbury Tales journey. And of course, what's interesting is um, the friars, the summoner, excuse me, said, for while I know your patience is gone, you won't be able to take this ridicule. I know, he says on line 849, your heart will go into mourning. I know your patience is gone. You will not be able to take my ridicule. So they are, oh, I'm going to mock you, I'm going to mock you, I'm going to curse you, I'm going to curse you. Oh, you won't be able to bear it. Oh, I'm going to make people laugh at you. It's absolutely hilarious and ridiculous. And then the host jumps in, peace, right now, anon, and said, let the woman tell a tale. You act as if you'd been drunk on ale. Do, tell your tale, dame, that's what's best. And she says, I'm all ready, right as you please, if I have permission of this worthy friar if he'll let me this worthy friar and he admits yes dame quoth he tell forth i will hear and uh, we've got this brilliant interruption and it's a transition it's a transition from the prologue to the tale 
in giving a form of an argument, we lay the ground for further tales in the collection which exploit the conflict. Because, of course, you've still got the conflict of mastery. You've still got the conflict of the wife and the church. And the wife is also ready to begin her tale. And uh, doubtless, the audience have been impatiently waiting. And it is a joke. It's meant to be a joke. There is a long preamble of a tale. And, of course, the irony is the tale is only half as long. The prologue is a, mo is a major, or possibly the major component in the portrayal of the wife and her views. But it also sets up so many things. The conflict of genders, the mastery of women, men and their behaviour, men and their roles, right and wrong, morality, treatment of women, so many it themes that are raised in the prologue that are then explored in the tale. <laughs>